Good morning. It is good to be back with you. I want to express my thanks to the men who filled in why I was gone. Um, all the names escaped me, but I handed you all thank you cards this morning, so I personally all thank you. Uh, so I, I appreciate it. Um, had two good meetings in Alaska. I appreciate the elders willing to let me be gone for so long. Um, I think much progress was made. Many people were reached with the gospel. Uh, the congregation in Fairbanks, where we are supporting David Halbrick there, um, they, had a, they had an individual show up the week before the meeting, and not a Christian, and shows up every night at the meeting, and even brings people to the meeting. And so the local work there will be following up with many of those individuals. It's a very good meeting. But as I told some of you, at the beginning of my second meeting, I loved the brethren there. I was ready to come home. <laughs> I was ready to dry out. It rained the whole time, which was fine. It was still a beautiful state, but I was ready to come back, get back to Arizona where it's a cool 100 at night. Um, I, I, I love my, my home here. I love you guys. I love being here. Um, if you open your Bible this morning to the book of Exodus, this is where we're beginning this morning. I think a very straightforward lesson about what it, what it means or what is the right attitude when it comes to the Word of God. What is the mindset that we need to have when it comes to our service to God? And this morning, really, the outlines in the bulletin, we're going to be looking at how, even though the children of Israel did not always follow through with this attitude, they exemplified or they expressed the attitude rightly in Exodus 19. We're going to see in how this attitude requires humility and honesty with ourselves and with others. And this attitude requires a long obedience throughout our entire life in order for us to be faithful until the end. We need this attitude. While I was in Alaska, again, the brethren were great. Uh, two of them are studying with another preacher in the town that they're at and realize that some of the things that are being taught and some of the issues being dealt with some in the church right now, it's, uh, this attitude is not always there, unfortunately. This one preacher the men are studying with has an attitude of, well, we really don't need to hold firm on doctrine. As long as we pay lip service to the ones of Ephesians 4, then we can have fellowship with one another. Many individuals, and we've seen examples in Tucson, treat God's commands like it's a buffet. I pick and choose which ones I want. I'll probably avoid that fish over there because it looks kind of weird. Um, I, I don't like how, how that's worded, so I, I'm going to avoid that. Instead of approaching the Word of God as the complete meal that it is, if you want to continue that food analogy. So again, as I said, as we begin this morning, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 19. To set the context, the children of Israel have just come out of Egyptian bondage where they had been for 400 years. From the time of the first plague until the time of them arriving at Sinai, it's roughly about a year that they have been experiencing these things between the first plague and this point. They have seen the, act, they have seen the power of God at work. The plagues of darkness, the gnats, the frogs, the river to blood, and the death of the firstborn. Which is a side point, maybe you want to study this later today, that each of those ten plagues attack directly one of the gods of Egypt. Not only is God displaying his power, but he's showing he is the only true sovereign, the only true God. They have not only seen that, they saw God part the Red Sea, destroy the army of Pharaoh, and now they have arrived at Mount Sinai, where they are to receive the covenant. Starting in chapter 19, verse 3. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, and saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, to the, and tell to the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. They are at Mount Sinai. They haven't yet received the covenant, but this is a condition to receive the covenant. God is laying out the terms, if you will. And the first thing God does is he reminds them that he is a God of justice and of wrath. He says, you yourselves saw what I did to the Egyptians. 
They had oppressed you for 400 years. You saw how I executed justice upon them for your sake and my sake. And he reminds them of his goodness, how he blessed them. Not only did I smite the Egyptians, but I bore you out of Egypt as on eagles' wings. I brought you to myself. You did not do this. Moses did not do this. I did this. Moses was my instrument, but all that Moses did was carry out my commands. I was the one who wrought the miracles. Then verse 5 is key. Now then, the conclusion, if. Such an important two-letter word. It means a world of difference when it comes to the Bible. If. It means a world of difference in, even in everyday affairs. If you will indeed, not just lip service obey, but indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. Two things there, they go hand in hand. Then there is a blessing attached to that. Then you will be my possession. You will be my people for all the earth is mine. You should be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God, we know that God owns everything. He controls everything. He even says so in the text, all the earth is mine. So why, why is this idea that you'll be my own treasured possession, my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine? The promise is that, yes, I own everything, but you're going to be my people that I'm going to show off to the world. You think about the promises of Israel. Where ancient Israel sat was literally the crossroads of the ancient world. All the wealth of the east came through that region, and all the wealth of the west came through as well. The Silk Road made tracks over the northern Israel. It was a highway. And so all that traffic, if Israel would indeed obey and keep the covenant, they would have seen the glory and the goodness of God and what God does in people's lives. He was going to show them off. I made this comment in class. I, I don't have a wife yet, so there's no one to chastise me for buying another Bible or another book. I can just leave them everywhere. It's great. Um, I have a lot of Bibles. I like to think no matter where I sit down in my house, there's a Bible within arm's reach. But of all the Bibles I have, there's one particular one that was gifted to me recently that I love to show off. Um, Homer Haley's Old Testament. It's got all his notes in red ink. All that you should see what Isaiah and Daniel and the prophets look like in that Bible. And yes, I did not agree everything that that man taught. But I appreciate his earnesty, his willingness to preach the gospel, to study deeply. It's a Bible that's falling apart. I'll never be able to use it. But that Bible sits on a shelf in my office where all can see. And I love every opportunity to take it out and say, look at this. Look at the wealth of knowledge and the years of labor spent in this. Not that Homer Haley is akin to Scripture. But you can appreciate the effort. And this is much like what God's saying to them. You're going to be my prized possession. That you're going to be my conversation piece in the living room. I'm going to show you off to everyone. You're going to be my own special people. So Moses came down from the mountain and told all these words to the people. And we see in verse 8, what did the people answer? All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. It's a great attitude. It's the right attitude. We chapter, jump over to chapter 24. Chapter 20, God gives the Ten Commandments, which are really the heart of the law. And God expands upon the principles taught therein. In the later part, he gives the ordinances. He talks about property rights, because who doesn't love talking about property rights in chapter 22? He deals with the various laws regarding land and the Sabbath and how they're to conquest the land. And we then Moses comes down and delivers all this to the people. And here we see again, now that there's actually more conditions and more stipulations, the law has been given more fully. They repeat the same thing in verse 3 of chapter 24. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Now I'm sure you're waiting for the the but here when he comes to Israel. You turn over a couple pages 
to chapter 32. We won't read it, but you may want to mark it down. Moses took too long in the mountain, so they thought. And my, my, how easily do we get distracted. They're like, we don't know what happened to this Moses character. And so they look at his brother Aaron. Make us a God. Make us a God. Now, the rest of the history, there was justice and retribution for this idolatry. The sons of Levi execute God's justice upon those who went into this and did not repent. And Israel did not always follow through with this attitude. But just because of their lack of good example doesn't mean that you and I cannot follow through with this attitude. We need to have an attitude of all that the Lord says we will do. And Israel had good periods. Every time they had a judge, during the kingship of David and the beginning years of Solomon, the people were devoted. During the times of restoration underneath Hezekiah and Josiah and Ezra and Nehemiah, the people were devoted, and they were seeking to do all that the Lord says. And that's, those are the periods of Israel's history we want to look back on and, and emulate. But having this attitude of all the Lord says we will do requires humility and honesty on our part. It requires humility in the recognizing who we actually are. One, that we're not God. In the bulletin, it's not in the PowerPoint, but in the bulletin, if you turn over to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, this is a verse I much like. And when I preached through it, I think I did a whole sermon on this section. And, but in Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, the wisdom of Solomon says here in verse 1, Guard your steps as you go to the house of God, and draw near to listen, rather than offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive, impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven, and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. That phrase, God is in heaven and you are on the earth, reminds us of our status before God. We are not God. We are not the creator. That takes some honesty to recognize and admit to ourselves that I do not know better, but God does. And so having this attitude of all the Lord says first requires that I recognize this fundamental fact. You know, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 that we need to humble ourselves underneath the hand of God, the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt us at the proper time. And if you invert the verse, you get a warning. You exalt yourself at the improper time, God will very well make sure that he will humble you underneath his mighty hand. For the Lord is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So I want to look at two examples. First is King Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, here we find a man that did not have humility and was full of self-delusion. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're just going to be starting around verse 17. To set the context, as you turn there, Saul was to be God's instrument of justice upon the Amalekites. They have been given over 400 years to get their act together. The reason why this justice is coming is because when the children of Israel came out of the Exodus, the Amalekites, the original ones, would come down and prey upon the weak, the sick, and the old at the back of the caravan without regard to justice or mercy. And if that was enough, during the time of Judges, they allied themselves with the pagan nations around them and came in and raided Israel repeatedly. And they have been a thorn in Israel's side for centuries. And God is merciful, yes. We see the Amalekites received his mercy for 400 years. But God is also just, and justice must be executed. So the command was simple. Saul, you are to be my instrument of justice upon the Amalekites. Destroy them utterly, completely. Now, this is not Saul's first disobedience. He presumptuously offered a sacrifice when he was not authorized to do such a thing. He had his foolish order in 1 uh, Samuel 14. His previous disobedience made it where his line, his family, would no longer be on the throne. Saul would have finished out his reign as king. But this disobedience in chapter 15 is what would lead to God removing Saul as king 
and seeking out David, the son of Jesse. So Saul goes and destroys the Amalekites. He keeps all the best stuff for himself, and he captures King Agag, which in the ancient world, to capture another head of state, another king, um, there's really nothing comparable to it today. It, it was the ultimate uh, gravitas, if you will, the ultimate crowning achievement. Everyone kept a wide berth from you because, wow, you were able to capture another king. I, I'm, I'm not going to go near you. You're too dangerous to be near. So it's a bit of a pride thing there, too. But Samuel shows up to the camp. And he basically says, God told me something last night. And of course, Saul is all excited. Yeah, tell me. Let, let me know what it is. Verse 17, Samuel said, Is it not true that though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord set, set you on a mission and to say, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and to fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Notice the delusion. 20. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord, and went on the mission which the Lord sent me, and brought back King Agag of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil sheep and oxen and the choices of things devoted to destruction to sacrifice the Lord your God at Gagal. There's so many things we can make a point here about. First is the, the delusion of twisting and distorting what God actually said. I did obey. And then he, see you, he adds his modifiers. God said destroy them utterly. I did obey. And I did this, this, and that. He viewed it as part of the command. He twisted what God had said. Secondly, there's pride here and self-delusion. He couldn't possibly uh, see it. That, oh, I would never, far be it for me to ever violate the word of God. But notice there's shifting of blame. He won't fess up that he did this. First of all, he says, I did obey. I kept all this. I kept King Yanga. But it, it, those people, the people... They're to blame. You don't have to answer this, but since when is a sovereign king beholden to the whims of the people? Since when does the, the, the leader of a nation take orders from the people, excluding democracies for a moment? But even then, say somehow I had a line to the White House and President Biden picked up and I told him what I thought should happen. And say, I had, you know, I had thousands of people behind me, and we, we think this is the right course of action. Do you think Biden would actually listen to us? No. And it's not for other reasons either. It's for the sheer fact that he was elected, and in this country, when you're elected president, it gives you certain authority, and you're not beholden to the, will, the whims of the people except in elections. There's consequences, don't get me wrong. And I'm belaboring the point. <laughs> he was in charge. King Saul could have done whatever he wanted to and often did whatever he wanted to do. And he betrays himself here too. You know, if it really was the people, he could have said, well, the, the, the people took some of the spoil. But he betrays his real motives here. It's most like the, the child getting caught with chocolate around their face. Who ate the cookie? I... I, I I don't know, Mom. I, I don't know who ate that very hot, warm, fresh, delicious chocolate chip cookie. I, I don't know who could have done it. The child's singing so much of that delicious cookie they ate, they betray themselves and they start describing its delectableness. And Saul's doing the same thing. He goes, well, the people took some of the spoil. I don't know who took those good breeding cattle and those wonderful new sheep and and the oxen, that would be really good for plant. Excuse me, I, I don't, uh, the people did that. The, the people did that. You can see Saul's you know, excited over the fact that he's going to enrich himself in this. But I belabored the point too much on this. Saul showed himself not to have humility of any kind. Prideful. I'm the king. I can do no wrong. 
And with that, he doesn't have the honesty to even admit his wrongdoing. Doesn't even have the honesty with himself to recognize that he might possibly have not done what the Lord said. Meanwhile, we look at his successor in 2 Samuel chapter 12. We will not read the account with David and Bathsheba, but this is what the account we're going to be reading the later part of it on. Just a couple recap points for that. The text is very clear. Verse, chapter 11, verse 1 tells us, Now it came about in the course of time in the season when kings go out to war, King David was in Jerusalem. The text tells us already from the get-go that David was shirking his responsibility as sovereign. So he's moseying about in his room. He peeks over into somebody else's private chambers. And right there he could have said, no, turned away, I wasn't supposed to see that, go do his duty. David doesn't do that. He lets it fester. He dwells upon it. He becomes obsessed with it. He uses his authority to king to say, bring her to me. He orchestrates, I mean, he commits adultery with her. There's a child of the natural consequence of that. He brings in Uriah, and Uriah is too good of a man to spend one night with his wife while his troops are out there in the field. He says, it's not right. He sleeps on the doorstep. So David's plan to try and cover up this sin doesn't work. It never works. You can't cover up sin. It doesn't work. And so David's going on about this, and you know, there's sin to go around here. Don't get me wrong. Everyone has a fault here. In chapter 12, we read that the Lord sent Sam, uh, Nathan the prophet to David. If I ever wanted to cite a text for the power of illustration, this would be the text. Verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David and came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished, and he grew up together with him and his children, and would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and, he, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it, and for, uh, prepared it for the man who had come to him. David's anger burned greatly against the man and said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely this man who has done this thing deserves to die. He must take, make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Then Nathan said to David, You're the man. I'm picturing David red in the face, filled with righteous indignation at this injustice. And Nathan just looking at him just bluntly, just bewildered at the fact that David hasn't made the connection yet. And very humbly, very softly, Lord, sir, you're the rich man. You took the poor man's lamb. Except it wasn't a lamb. You took Uriah's wife. And not only that, you killed Uriah. I can imagine any of you have been gut-checked or had the wind knocked out of you. That's why I imagine David feeling right now. So David could have acted like Saul. No, he didn't. You have no proof of the matter. Or as our politicians like to say, I can neither confirm nor deny your accusation. Nathan says further in verse 9, his sin, he says, why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? There's many sins that David committed there. There's a curse in verses 10 and 11. The sword shall not depart from the house of David. He could have shifted blame. It was Bathsheba's fault. She had no business bathing in her own home. He could have shifted blame of, well, Uriah should have you know, spent time with her that night. All excuses Saul would have made. David doesn't fight it. He knows he did wrong. So what does he say in verse 13? I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. David had the humility to recognize he was not God. 
and the honesty to confess that to himself and the honesty with the Word of God itself that I'm not in line with what it teaches. And he made the necessary corrections. He had to deal with the consequences of the sin. Do not be, get me wrong. He had to deal with those consequences. But brethren, many times when we study the Word of God, we are going to come in moments like David, hopefully not for the same reasons, but you're going to read something in the Word of God and it's going to gut check you. You're going to feel your, your guts twist up in the inside because you realize that you are not doing what the Lord says. You are either omitting or committing. You have failed in your duty in some capacity. I remember one night, I'm, I'm reading my Bible as a new convert, and I come across a verse I've read many times before in 1 Corinthians, 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, excuse me, where Paul says, Be not deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. I had read that so many different times. I don't know why that particular time it gut checked me. I think it was because I was coming to an awareness that the friends I was hanging out with were not the best for me. We weren't out doing drugs or stealing or arsony or committing fornication, any of that. Just they were, they were people of the world who had no interest in changing. At least 14-year-old me thought so. Um, and I think I was coming to an awareness that for my own spiritual well-being, I need to take a break. That night, I read that text. It got checked me, and I had two options. I can either obey the blessed command, as we often sing, or I can disregard the word. Thankfully, I had the humility and honesty to say, no, this, this needs to happen. The time left, I don't want to turn on too long, it's not a lot, I promise. We want to look at Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul. Because we may have the humility and honesty, but if we're not committed to the long haul when it comes to all that the Lord says, we're not going to make it. We're first introduced to Saul of Tarsus in Acts, the seventh chapter, at the stoning of Stephen. And we're told that the men there were laying their coats by the feet, at the feet of a young man named Saul of Tarsus. And on that day arose a great persecution against the church of God. And Saul of Tarsus was in hearty agreement, putting Stephen to death, arresting Christians, bring him in chains to do so the Sanhedrin can do as they saw fit with them. In Acts chapter 9, we're re we read about how he had a face-to-face -face confrontation, or a meeting, excuse me, with Jesus. And it's interesting to me that Jesus hardly says anything to him. He has a lot more to say in Ananias, but he, what Jesus says to him in Acts chapter 9, he first asks him a question, why are you persecuting me? I think Saul of Tarsus, Tarsus recognized this is either God or some divine being or somebody worth listening to because he says, who are you, Lord? Verse 5, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and it will be told to you what you must do. That's all Jesus said to Saul. I find it more interesting what he said in Ananias. It says a lot more. And when he says Ananias, I, I like to think that Ananias, his response is, yes, Lord. I don't know if Ananias was receiving discussion or talk from Jesus on a routine basis or if Ananias ever walked with the Lord. But it seems to me that Ananias was not freaked out in the slightest when Jesus appeared to him and talked to him or talked to him. The Lord basically says, I want you to go preach to Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias had the same reaction that you and I probably would have had if we were in that first century. Lord, you, you, you do know what he did, right? Yes, I know what he did. He, he's, he's persecuting Christians. I, I know what he did. He's, he, he, he voted for the death of Stephen. Ananias... I know what I'm doing. You're going to go preach to him. You're going to go preach the gospel to him. Here's why. I have chosen him. He will be my instrument, and he will learn how much he will have to suffer for my name's sake. And I can see at that point Ananias going, and this is my comical reading into it, I'm terrified, but I'm going to go. Okay. I mean, no matter, we, we would be fearful at least a little uneasy. 
So Ananias goes. He preaches the gospel to him. Saul obeys that gospel. In Acts 9, verse 18, it says, and after he regained his sight, he got up and immediately he was baptized. When Saul recalls this account years later in Acts 22 and verse 16, or Acts 22 is where, um, it should be Acts 20, 14 through 16, excuse me, not, it should be 22, not 20, sorry. Um, we're told more of what Ananias said to him. The Lord God has seen fit for you to see a vision of the righteous one, to hear an utterance from his mouth, and to be an instrument of his, uh, of his gospel. Paraphrasing. And so he immediately rose and was baptized. Go back to Acts 9 to verse 20. Days after he is converted. The text says, Immediately Saul, he, began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. Saul, at a relatively young age, began preaching Christ. And he would learn firsthand how much he had to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Beatings without number, persecutions, poisonings, a night and a day he spent in the deep, as Paul said in Corinthians. And, I believe it's in Ephesians or Galatians, when he talks about, well, see with what large letters I am writing to you, he's not talking about length. He's talking about the size of the letters. This is before Braille. This is before any, really, glasses of any kind. I'm convinced that Saul was losing his vision towards the end of his life, but that did not detract him or deter him from still doing the work. Not to mention the thorn in his flesh, whatever that was. He had many problems, many persecutions. And yet, if we go to 2 Timothy, chapter 4, 7 and 8, He recognizes the, end, the time of his end has come. He will not escape Rome in prison this time. He says to Timothy in verse 7 of first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and all, only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. It was not easy for Paul, raised in Judaism, steeped in the traditions, the inspired writer to say he was blameless as far as regarding to the righteousness that is in the law, Philippians 3. It was not easy for him to throw that all away. But when he was confronted with the truth of the gospel, he had the same choice you and I have to make. Do we believe it? and obey it, or do we reject it to our own peril? He believed and obeyed it. And he just didn't obey it once. He continued in obedience to the Gospels his entire life, to where at the end of his life, he could say confidently, without any doubt, that he had fought in the good fight. He had come to the end of his race, and he knew where his treasure lay. We studied that outline from Curtis Porter this morning. In that book, there's a little biography of him. I won't try to pronounce the disease, but it was a very rare blood disease in which too many red blood cells are produced. It causes a thickening of the blood. Normally, upon diagnosis, you have about two years. He received that in his 40s, I believe. He received experimental radiation treatment in California that prolonged his life 16 years. That blood, that blood disease eventually went into leukemia in the 40s, and that's it's still a serious diagnosis today. Imagine so almost all those years ago. He knew that his death would eventually by, be by hemorrhage. That's how it went. And one afternoon, he started to feel the hemorrhage. It was a, it was a cerebral one. He knew the end was near. He calmly called his family together, said who he wanted to preach his funeral, where was to be, who was going to be his pallbearers, made his last will and testament right there and there, very calm, fully assured of where he was going. I remarked to my friend, I said, I, when I get to be that age and when it comes to be my time, I want to be able to face death like Brother Porter, 
my brother Paul, the apostle, with a confidence, knowing in my conscience that I have indeed fought the good fight. I have come to the end of my course. I have finished my race. Now's my time. But we can only get to that point of such assurance if we continue steadfastly until the end, if we continue in the faith, if we have the attitude that our lives are governed by all that the Lord says we will do. If you're here this morning, you haven't been saved, you haven't obeyed the gospel. I found this old chart I used to use, and I wonder where it went, and prepping for me, I found it again, so there we go. It's the most important question any man can ask, any person can ask. It's what the Philippian jailer said in Acts 16, verse 30. What must I do to be saved? If you've heard the gospel, which is that Jesus came and lived the perfect life for you and I, he died on the cross, as was written on the third day, and now is reigning in heaven, ready to make intercession for you, you've heard the gospel. Do you believe that gospel? Jesus said in John 8, 24, that unless you believe that I am he, you will likewise perish. We agree with our religious friends on this. Faith and belief are absolutely essential. But what do you do with that belief? If you believe that Jesus died for your sins and recognize that he does not want us to sin, you need to turn away from your sins. That's repentance. Jesus also said in Luke 13, 3, that I tell you, unless you repent, you'll likewise perish. Also essential. You ready to make the good confession of faith in Christ before the presence of many witnesses? Jesus said in Matthew 10 that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And finally, you need to unite your life with Christ in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, that the one who believes and is baptized shall be saved, the one who believes not shall be condemned. The apostles preached this message on the day of Pentecost. When they asked him, what must we do to be saved from our sins? Peter responded, repent, and each one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're here this morning and have need to be, um, uh, be baptized for remission of your sins, or you need prayer of strength, of restoration, uh, sin that needs confessing, whatever it is, once you come, let's see how we stand and sing the song that's been selected.